pleasure to be here. I've never been West Dublin before in all these years, so it's ridiculous that I'm not. And it's been like months in the kind of gestation of more than that. Many. Um, what I thought I'd do is to try to give you a flavour of a number of the activities that I've been doing. So it's the, the kind of potted version there. I'm a kind of academic who um, went to the dark side, really, um, who left academia. I took my job in 2002 after 12 years of lecture to start off uh, trying to get telly off the ground and then get back into academia. But I've been kind of juggling these two worlds really for the last 10 years, I'm trying to understand, um, well I guess both of them, but what, I, what academia is relatively comfortable with, um, the communication of the public is the, is the one that's harder. So this to the rock we have this kind of plays on that notion that the rock is obviously geology, geoscience, and that's that difficult. And if you're doing degrees, etc., PhDs in it, realise how difficult that is. But actually, that is a really easy compared to the hard place, which is the public and the public's understanding of geology, and that's what I want to, to really explore. And I'll do that um, using a number of, of, of examples. Um, so let's start with this example. On uh, the 1st of April, April Fool's Day 2011, there was a, a magnitude 2.2 earthquake near Blackpool. And this was the UK's first announcement of fracking, of hydraulic fracture. Um, so geologists, this is Elvin Rutter, structural geologist at Manchester, geologists came on the news and pointed out that this earthquake was more than likely not triggered by the, this process of, of hydraulic fracturing that a company called Quadrilla were doing just uh, nearby. And, um, this really was the announcement of a process that had been going on offshore for many decades, but really had, was the first time that the UK public had realised it was going on on their doorstep. Hydraulic fracturing, which is the injection of large forms of water with sand and chemicals down a couple of miles to break open shale rock and release the tight hydrocarbons that are inside. But immediately, this 2.2 earthquake had ripples that went uh, far and wide. So locally, this is the Ribble Estuary Anti-Fracking Group, that organised itself within days to be a very effective um, group against it. Partly it was able to uh, organise itself so effectively because it's essentially the same group that opposes wind farms in the local area. Um, and then before long, across the country, this notion of fracking swept through and until the end, that we have a situation in the UK where everyone knows the practice. If you're a geologist, this is, I know, the same in Ireland. If you're a geologist, but that's always the first question to ask me. What do you think of fracking? So, I just want to explore this uh, a little bit, and I'm going to come back to this uh, later on. Because I think one of the interesting things about this is that um, what, it, what fracking does is it suddenly shines a light on a, the subsurface world that is the geologist world. So geologists, we spend all our time lamenting, since we were talking about it earlier, lamenting that no one's really interested in what we do. And then along comes fracking and everyone wants to know about geology and what we do down there and all the rest of it. Some people will find that very uncomfortable. But actually, part of the thing in communications is trying to get people to be interested in what we're doing. And, I want to get a sense of, of people's concern. This is um, in relation to the earthquakes induced by fracking. And this is from a master thesis that has interviewed, semi structured interviews with a number of focus groups of normal people, ordinary people. We're making this point later on that for those geologists in the audience, you're not normal people. <laughs> normal people. This is an interview. He said, Well, it's the foundation of this country, and it's, if that happens all over the country, it worries me. And I think it would make them very unstable, this is the rocks, I'd have that feeling. And they always said, well yeah, fracture means break, doesn't it? Absolutely. You're breaking something. And this is one of uh, a kind of constant repeated narratives. Uh, for example, it comes through um, lots of different things, carbon capture storage and all that, and some of the rest of the things. There's a pristine world down there that we are 
our interventions are breaking into and despoiling. And it's, a, it's a view that for geologists is quite odd, perverse even, but for the public this is a very common, uh, common viewpoint. The idea that fracturing, for what's just a word, the idea that we're breaking these foundations of our, of our country is very strong. And this one I think is even more useful. A mother from a mother and toddlers group says, well, again talking about the same thing, earthquakes uh, induced by fracturing. It's where they're drilling and it like vibrates the earth and it causes earthquakes. And somebody was saying, yes it does, it's okay, it's manageable. That was recently. My instinct went, well what are you doing? You know, it's not right. It doesn't feel right. What I think is interesting about this quote is, I think there's three components at least in it. There's the first part, is that these first kind of few words in it, the, you can tell this is a person who's not really sure of the technical language they're using. They're not awkward, slightly awkward use of the words. And in many cases, we see this with new technologies that people will acknowledge they don't know the technicalities of what they're, they're talking about. So that person's not especially au okay with uh, with geology. And then it says somebody was saying, and that's presumably an expert. Someone's going to tell you on the radio and what it was, and it said something about it. And that uh, said, really, you know, there's nothing to worry about. Now, you might expect that if you put that combination together of someone who doesn't know the technicalities, acknowledges they don't know the technicalities, and an expert, that what would happen is the person would say, well, look, I don't know any of this, but you're the expert, so, okay, I'll really go with you. But that's not the way it works. And so this is the really key bit, is that the person then goes on their instinct. And the interesting thing is that, like, Industry, we pay huge amounts of money for people's instinct, their gut feeling, their heuristics. If you're an experienced mining geologist or petroleum geologist, you get paid big money for you going, forget all the data, that's what it is. But we tend to get a bit annoyed when the public do the same trick on us. So, this notion of instinct, and more importantly, something that it doesn't feel right, is a really interesting problem because. Almost all the problems I'm interested in, I've picked fracking for one because it's very uh, topical, it's very topical here, it's very topical in the UK, but it's symptomatic of a thing which is immensely complicated technically, but actually it then is the communication of it is almost like 10 times more messy in, in contesting. Um, so, what I'm interested in is how do people see our world, our sub surface world? Because by and large, they haven't had the advantage of spending three, four years studying undergraduate, maybe doing a master's or doing a PhD. Their perception of that world down there has come from other sources. But on the basis of that perception, they're making um, judgments and instinct about many of these very controversial issues. So, a few years ago, I got interested because it was geothermal exploration plan for the Southwest. And uh, one of the companies was saying that they, after the fracking incident in Blackburn, they lost some of their investors and people were getting very worried because a geothermal essentially fracks as well. And so they were stuck, people were saying, well, you're going to cause earthquakes. Suddenly I don't like geothermal anymore. So I get interested in this. And so I had a PhD student working with cognitive psychology, trying to uh, basically understand what people think about the subsurface, what's going on. Uh, I'm going to go into details, but actually, this idea, for example, of flowing rivers, although they're in the Burren, and actually in this region you actually do get flowing rivers, but even, even in any part of the world, um, that idea that there's rivers flowing in the subsurface comes up very strongly. But let me take you through what. Um, so, Hazel, our PhD student, has been basically <coughs> doing sound structures interviews with people. And these are all people in the southwest. So, this is mining country, for example. It's Tin, um, zinc mine. So, and obviously, thinking of heat, so this person says, I would think, you know, within 100 meters of the surface, you know, you have no difference in temperature. It's really hot down there, you walk around, you know, hard hat and underpants. So, it's hot. That's, the, that's one of the kind of senses. So, the first thing, one of the things that Hayes has been looking at is what do geologists think about it? What is it that goes through our heads? Because we've been trained to look in this way. And the cognitive psychologists have this idea of a mental models approach, which is by which tries to understand what is in our heads as experts and compare it to what's in the heads of non-experts. 
And so the geologist needs to be recognized because it's white male with a beard and a hammer. Um, it has to be, it's not a geologist. Um, they will be asked to, here's a little, so this basically, what Hazel does is she's got a, a cube, it's about a meter by a meter by a meter. And um, on the top of it is the area of the person's district, five kilometers across. So that's five kilometers, five kilometers at infinite scale. And so the implication, as it's never said, is that that's five kilometers as well. So here's a geologist's interpretation. And notice you've got some faults coming through there, get cologne, that's a kilometer's depth, that's five kilometers, killers, granite, so there's some technical work. But actually, there's not much on there, it's quite basic. What I'm going to now show you is what the public's views are different. And they say this is all from the local area around the park, which is the case. So. so here's one, and this is the person. Again, talk about what they might find. You keep going down to the bay. You eventually hit very hot rocks of the cold down there. Um, if it's not from the heat being radiated, it's, it's from being enclosed. I'm sure it will get hotter. Decent miners. A lot of the miners there are virtually in the I don't know what this is, but naked. <laughs> 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 I'm talking about miners, but this nakedness of heat. But clearly, this picture of these guys working away sweating and just in their pants or something like that is a very important one. But this is this person's. Um, drawing, one interesting thing, not a single person in all the Hazel subjects used a third dimension. They only used one. All the geologists used another dimension. Um, and we know that three dimensional thinking is an important part of it. So this is quite neat, it looks soil. Um, it says heather and gorse, for example. There's the mine working, stoke, hard rock, granite, Devonian, veins of copper, zinc, silver, gold. Um, it shows the mine in it. When Hazel said, yeah, but What's, what's beyond the mind? The pastor said, da. <laughs> so their, their knowledge of them, they, they, they're happy to go into the subsurface, but in a very anthropocentric uh, way. So again, someone talking about down the very bottom of the earth, because it's all broken down there, I presume that's where the heat. This is one where, again, we've got layers, that's good, and, and they go in time, industrial areas, agriculture, man appears, dinosaurs, older. The interesting bit here is that um, this is the centre of the earth. And when it was first drawn, it was drawn as a complete circle. And then the person, well, that's ridiculous, it can't be the circle, it's only. Um, and they drew it kind of like that. Um, but if you're a geologist taking this literally, that's a centre of the earth, the core of the earth, five kilometres down. Which explains why some people in that area objected to the geothermal exploration, because they said the magma will come out. We drilled out the magma will come out. Well, that made me laugh too, but then I was thinking about it. I was thinking, well, magma, so, so that means that they know that granite comes from, was once magma. That's quite good. Um, and also, presumably if you're going for geothermal, you know it must be hot, so that's quite good. So actually, the only thing that makes it ridiculous that the magma would come out is knowing the melting temperature of granite. And actually, I'm not sure many of my colleagues have put them on the spot, but they would tell them straight off the melting temperature of granite. But we kind of know it is ridiculous that it comes out. And some of the ones were very, not very helpful or complete. This is someone who had new buildings inside the earth. And when Hazel pressed them on, they said, well, because it was in the past, it's not there anymore. So this idea of history kind of catching up. Other people just didn't have a clue. So there were some pictures of things. So they shoved a little picture of a granite. And they've got some kind of soil there. Um, and, and other people um, just weren't able to do very much at all. And the question, it's kind of hot stuff, you know. Um, so Hazel said, you know, how far do you get when this, the hot stuff comes in? And the person said, probably a thousand miles deep. I don't know, I can't really visualize it. I think this is the point, is that ordinary people cannot visualize the substance. They don't, they've not had the training. They're, but where would they get it from? Where would you understand the subsurface from? get it from some Hollywood movie or God forbid from some television documentary. But you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't get it from anywhere else. So it's perfectly reasonable that people don't understand the subsurface. I think what is strange is that we have maybe surprised that people don't get the subsurface to any of the, the degree that we would maybe expect them to. So my interest then is um, really, especially now, is getting people to think about the subsurface and think about how we might make that public. How do we get out to people about the subsurface? And I'm going to, particularly going to talk about uh, television because it was it's, it, most of the information we get comes from uh, or the public gets comes from television information. And then um, 
one of the reasons why I'm interested in this is because there's lots of really important issues pertaining to the subsurface. It's not just fracking. There's carbon capture and storage, which is a big issue. On the, certainly in the UK, on the, the horizon is the new consultation on radioactive waste disposal. There's the geothermal that's appearing in various places. So this is an issue where people's uh, kind of ignorance in the sense of not knowing about this, this frontier is really quite important. And in many respects, the questions that we're going to get are really quite detailed. For example, this is a survey of questions about sub, uh, carbon capture storage. And I appreciate people at the back have no idea um, what's on here. But I want to just draw attention. This one says the deeper you drill into the subsurface, the higher the pressure gets. Now, for a geologist, that is a one on one, a basic stuff. As you go deeper, the pressure gets higher. But actually, only maybe half the public, or it's pool here, actually thought that was the case. And then, you know, what, almost fifth thought it wasn't the case. And that is implication. So down here it says, you know, how do you see uh, carbon capture storage or carbon injection? Do you see the injection of CO2 as being comparable to a sponge which is soaking up the CO2? That's how geologists see it. The CO2 is taken up in pores and the fractures rather than like a sponge. So only a quarter of the public would see it that way. Far more see it as injected CO2 to the subsurface like pumping up a huge balloon on the ground. And the reason why that's there is because there's that uh, difficulty in thinking of the pressure. And of course, if you pump up a balloon, what's it going to do? It's going to burst, and you're going to get lots of stuff out. So this stuff is actually quite sophisticated and complicated. And, um, and so the public are going to get asked quite technical, uh, complex issues about this environment that they struggle to even think about quite basic things. But then again, if you look at people, say, well, the public's stupid. That's a problem. The public's so, so stupid. There's this thing called the option scale, which um, basically asks Barry, it's been asking these same questions really for decades in various countries around the world. Uh, and so uh, we, we can see that actually the public's understanding of basic science hasn't really changed in the last few decades. Um, so a question like the centre of the earth is very hot. Who thinks that's true? <laughs> well, I really have to report back on your own. It's shocking. Um, well, it is true, by the way. Uh, the continents are moving slowly about the surface now. They've done a whole series on this. Um, but actually, only three quarters would say it's true. About a tenth say they don't know. Oh, sorry, a fifth they don't know. Almost a, uh, a tenth say it's not true the continents moving around. I guess it depends what you say is absolutely. <coughs> this is a good one. Early humans lived at the same time as dinosaurs. That is not true. <laughs> not true. But the majority of people either say it is true or don't know. It's a minority there. And this has led to this thing, this deficit model, which says the public is stupid. They don't know stuff. And actually our role as educators is to fill their empty heads with facts, with the technical information that they lack in order to be then informed for all of these complicated stuff that's coming to them. I have very little time for that model because I think it's, for a start, it's impossible. Um, how do you, you know, now this is, um, well, let me go back, the, the complexity of science now has been fractured into all of these different disciplines. I, I'm a structural geologist. I st st struggle to hold on to the basic literature in my discipline. And that is structural geology, which is a small part of geology, which is a even smaller part of science. So science is ballooning into these huge areas of specialism. And each of those specialisms laments the fact that the public is stupid about the area. So we have to then fill their empty heads with all of this stuff from all these different disciplines. And that, of course, is the ridiculous. Um, so the other approach it's very much to say, well, actually, let's think about what does the public want to know? What are they interested in? And so really what I've been doing for the last 10 years is making programs about what I think the public are interested in. And it started off with this one, as, uh, as we said, the, the, um, the journey from the centre of the earth was an idea that I pitched to the BBC as, I can't be more comment, really, Mediterranean, the men on a plate, I think it was called. 
Um, and it was going around the Mediterranean, around the plate boundary, talking stories up to the Dead Sea, talking biblical stories, doing Turkey, uh, then to Greece, talking with the Greeks. And it was fantastic, it was a brilliant premise, and then they decided to do it. And then the sales producer turned up on the first day and said, This is boring, isn't it? Oh. And she <laughs> said, Well, there's the way people die, volcanoes erupt, earthquakes, and stuff. And she said, if geology is to be of any interest to the wider public, it has to be of interest to what they're interested in. I said, okay. She said, well, for example, on oh, the train today, come to me, she said, and I read that, I did a program on that, and I read that the early artists only painted with browns and reds and blacks, because that's what they scraped from the ground. I said, well, yeah, it's true, it's weathering up, so she said, that's fascinating. I said, is it? <laughs> she says, it's boring to me. She says, no, that's fascinating because I've done lots of art school I've done lots of things. I've never ever had that before. And, uh, and she, she then had this notion about that the Egyptians who had sandstone plant blocks on to each other to produce the pyramids, and the Greeks had marble fashioned these beautiful temples, and the, the Romans had volcanic rocks to produce volcanic plastic cement. And we told the story of architecture of the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Romans, through three different rock types. That was all from a television producer trying to understand my subject. So that was recast from what I had into our belief, water, um, food, uh, and architecture. Uh, and I'll come back to this because that was very much a case of what is the public interested in, right, then you fit your stuff into the public, rather than what am I interested in, to get that stuff across. And I've kind of been doing that in different guises for the last decade, and I'm so far being caught. <laughs> but the thing is that geology actually works well on television. And it may seem odd to say that, um, but this is, I got a horizon to send me the, I've got a few horizons now, I got them to send me the, the viewing figures for the main horizons between 2000 and 2011. Um, and so what we see, like the top one, let's do the Persian mummy, that's our village one, 5.1 million. But then the next two, mega tsunami and super volcanoes, they come in, I think they've got our both our signs. There's one here called the Big Shells, there are signs, with extreme dinosaurs in there. Um, the Hunt for Super Twist, there are sciences, dinosaur, dinosaur, averting Armageddon, next up. It's disasters and dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Which might depress you to see the huge, exciting expanse of geoscience reduced to disasters and dinosaurs. But the interesting thing is, if you look at the category of geology compared to the rest of them, you see that the blue here of geology is by far the biggest cheese. And in fact, actually, some of these archaeology and climate ones, like uh, what's the, the Easter Island one, it could be wrapped into geology. But the interesting thing is the actual traditional sciences. So there's one called freak wave, which I gave to physics, but you could have had that potentially as an earth science one. Um, uh, chemistry one, I'm afraid, uh, there's this one here, which was um, the, uh, well, there's two. There's this living name, I think, but the truth about vitamins, which really health, came in there. And then there's another one, which the biology. Well, I could have found the one in the boy with no penis. But apart from it, because I haven't seen it, that is a psychology neuroscience one. So, even biology. Um, so, I think it's interesting that the big sciences, the holy trinity, physics, chemistry, and biology, certainly this one doesn't seem to play as well in terms of the standard like that. And, and I think one of the reasons for that um, is the notion of, of uh, history and narrative. Geology tells a story of something through time. And in that sense, it's a historical science in the way that uh, you know, archaeology is or cosmology is. It's about our cosmic past. That's a really important thing for creating a uh, story. So the other thing it does is it brings in real life dramatic incidents that have happened in the past. And both of those are really important ingredients. But, but it's, it does well on television. There's another interesting thing in here. Which is, if you look at the um, the, age, the dates, I've asked for the data for that decade. But actually, if you run through them, there's only one here from like 2010. The rest of them are all early part, um, uh, you know, around about the 2000. And some people are so say, well, that's because Horizon's rubbish. 
Horizon's really gone downhill. It's dumbed down. And I, you know, I used to watch it 10 years ago when it was decent, but now I have to say I never ever watch it. And you go, okay, well, that's possible, and, and I do often hear this. And, but I, something that I think is wrong with that view, and a couple of years ago, uh, two, yeah, two years ago, I did a program on fracking, very early on, I think. It was the major issue at that time. It got 1.8 million. We've never even made it onto this, this list. And the week before, that had been a horizon that got five and a half million. So it was off the charts here. Does anyone know what that horizon was on? It's on cats. It's on where your moggy goes at night. So apparently some cats go out and mix with other cats. And some cats go out and are alone. So that suggests to me that the great British public is not looking for more technical facts. It's actually the other way around, which some of you may find very impressive indeed, but persevere. And if you're not sure, um, the, the point is that science in general doesn't rate very well on television with the broad public. And I speak to, and uh, you're not the right audience to say this to, because you all like science, and I'll come back to who you are later. But actually, um, if you, so I've got lots of people say, Oh, there should be more programs like yours on television. I really find them fascinating. That's because you're in a little world, a little group of people who really like it. But the vast majority of people don't. And if you don't believe me, you walk into most of a bookshop. And you ask for the science section. And they'll take you to the back of the shop, round with new age thinking, and they'll tell you, I'm showing you a little section. So in there, you can ask for the geology section, if you wish. But there'll be like three books. Yeah. And then if you look around them, Bookshop outside the fiction, you'll see, uh, well, actually, this has got a whole thing of transport, which is kind of interesting. But you'll see history, you'll see architecture, you'll see art, you'll see photography, you'll see sport, you'll see food. And this relates back to what my first series producer was talking about. That's what you root into, what people are interested in. That's the way you reach these wider audiences. The audience of science is very, very small. And we're all in this room. <laughs> the other thing about books is quite interesting is when at that, that time when Horizon was in its heyday, certainly in terms of rating, every single BBC site Horizon producer went on this guy's course. This guy's Robert McKee, who writes a Hollywood script writing kind of tutorial. He goes around to giving workshops in, in Hollywood and in London and various places, three day workshop on how you tell stories. And he basically says that. There's only a certain number of ways to tell stories from the beginning of the time. And he's got this thing called calls it the central plot, which is you have an inciting incident at the start, that was the fracking by the way. Um, and you then have an act, uh, so you then have an act one that basically sets up a particular problem, a challenge, a mystery, whatever it is. You then have the journey. And the journey is the act two of getting to it. How did the individual or the group get to this place? And then what you have is an end of Act 2 twist. It comes in at 37 minutes past the horizon. And that was a, a false ending, a crisis. You thought you'd arrived at the end, and then suddenly it was whipped away from you, and it wasn't the ending, and it was a mad dash in the last 20 minutes to sew the whole thing back up. And horizon was really effective at doing that. It's just that eventually scientists get a bit knocked by having science always portrayed in this way. Because everything has to be resolved at the end. Everything has to be tied up. Can't be any loose ends. So people get well, that's kind of boring. But actually, McKee's thing is very important because what it tells you is if you can tell the story that way, then that's a very effective narrative device to fit your story into. And Jonathan Phillips, who's a, a geographer, a hydrologist, has actually argued that that as scientists we intuitively set our papers, our research papers, as narratives. They're not the same narratives that Hollywood uses. We develop our own narratives and the, the paper goes into those. But his point is that we are already doing that. We just haven't noticed that we're doing it. And this is his point, you know, that his hope is that our scientists recognise, perhaps even embrace our role as storytellers, so that we can more effectively use the value of storytelling to advance our science. So there's no harm in saying that when we write a paper or give a lecture, we're telling a story. That should be at the absolute core of what we do as, as communities. Now, in 2002, as I say, I 
chucked in my permanent job lecturing in, at Bruno University, and I went uh, into the great world of unemployment to try to get television off the ground. So this uh, is a, a graph, it's actually from the US, but where people get the data from, and this is talking about current news, but you can see in this instance, for example, television, predominant, and newspapers we can see, uh, this is so 2002, what in there, Newspapers still pretty dominant, you can see they're sliding down and the internet is rising up, probably doesn't surprise you. Uh, the next graph you're going to see is for generic science issues. And you'll see that since I joined television, its use of significance as an influence has dropped and the internet has risen up. So I have made a terrible, terrible mistake. <laughs> strategic boo boo. And if you look at specific issues, like fracking, carbon capture storage, GM, it's the internet that always has to be all the way through. So for wannabe communicators out there, I would say do not go into television. Not because it's difficult, it is, not because it's frivolous and flighty, it is, but because actually the future is trying to learn how to communicate via the internet, via that multi-fractured world but there's tons of stuff, you can upload things in a minute, but how do we communicate? Because that's where people are going to. It doesn't mean to say television's better, that's not what I'm saying. But that is a place where we can, we can learn to kind of uh, marshal, to wrangle that for communication to be really quick. And so here's my top tips as a communicator that chose the wrong path. Uh, and so these are things that I've learned from television. Uh, forget facts. Uh, tell stories. Uh, this is from uh, two climate scientists talking about communication of climate change, trying to craft messages that are well, simple, but memorable, we'll repeat them. Effective use of imagery, metaphor, and narrative. In short, be a better storyteller. Lead with what you know and let your passion show. It's not that the facts shouldn't be there, it's that the facts shouldn't drive. Of course, it should be factually correct. That's not what they're saying. But it's not that the facts are the important ingredients that will get people interested. It's the stories that get people interested. Second thing is dumbing down. And for me, dumbing down or simplification is the most basic graduate skill. It's the ability to take something technically complicated, dismantle it to its basic elements, and build it up to whatever level you want it to be. So I've heard plenty about dumbing down in television, but I've never yet had an academic walk out of a master's session and say, oh, I'm off to dumb down with the first students. The expectation is used, different language with different aspirations, different expectations. And this point from Steve Schneider, our climate scientist, is if you're not going to simplify, then really you're in trouble in terms of communicating that. But to do that, we have a problem. Because the scientific methodology starts with this broad area that we get introduced to as a research project, we read more, we then learn what the questions are, we go, we collect some data, we process that data, analyze, and we end up with a result. And we often then want to communicate that result to the public. But the way the public sees it is completely inverted. They have this point here where their first entry question is, Whoa, what are you, why is this relevant? What are you about to say? Why is it relevant to me? And if you can't get past that question, then you don't even get into, you're invited into telling them about some of the more detailed aspects. So the irony is, not that we're teaching people wrong, this is important, but this is a language of communication for scientists. So if we want to talk to the public, we have to adopt a very different way. We can't just use the mode that we've got for science to talk to, to the public. Another thing is about people. Um, which you might think is a problem for geologists, because in the rock record that I'm at, this is a quote from a paper that myself and Ted Neal from the Jolsoft did, uh, and this is Ted's words, which is why I use it. He says, it's a fact often overlooked by scientists that most other people are mostly interested in other people, and they're mostly not interested in anything else. The fact that scientists are more interested than average in things and ideas marks them out, marks you out, marks me out, as mentally very unusual. <laughs> the reason why, when you're sitting on the bus or the train or and people are sitting reading OK magazine or whatever it is, is they're interested in people. And the problem is that we seem to kind of uh, have a problem with that. But we actually do have lots of people. We have individuals, for example, geology. We have these guys who are wildcat miners um, in the kind of hills of Pennsylvania. They're fascinating characters. 
And but the other people that we have is ourselves. And I think this is another area which is uh, uh, some people find awkward and nervous, which is that when journalists often ask you about if you've done anything with, with the media, they'll often ask you about you. And you think, well, it's not about me, it's about my data, it's my information. So the point is, what we're getting at is you're likely to be, you, you being interesting is most likely to be the best way of taking sell a story. And we are interested because we're mentally very unusual. We go to strange places and we do strange things. We go off to the top of a mountain belt, we collect a rock, we come back, we crush it up into powder, we put it into the machine, we get a number out. That's kind of odd. That's kind of normal. But that is kind of intriguing. Why would you do that? So the point is that if you try to take yourself out of the equation, as we're talking to the scientific method, that might be good for science, because there's loads of communication. So you need to just get used to the fact that you're going to be part of the story and if you can make yourself a more interesting part of the story then you enhance the ability of people to actually then be interested in what you're talking about. And that's really the key. You're interested in people that have been curious about your data. And then the other thing is fire the imagination. That really just means use whatever will get people interested. So it's fine to talk about fracking. Because it's not, it doesn't have to be a toxic political issue, we'll come back to it later on. But it's a way of actually getting people to talk about what, you're into, what we're interested in, which is the same as some stuff. It could be people, it could be whatever. The other thing I'd say is, is we kind of forget, I think, as geologists, geoscientists, why we get into the subject in the first place. Most of us didn't get in because of what we are doing now. We got in because we just love being out in the open landscape, just fascinated by fossils or minerals or something like that. But as we kind of get more and more into the kind of narrow zone, um, we've, we've kind of forgotten that a little bit. Um, but actually, I love this quote from John McPhee, the writer. Uh, he says, where the gaps exist among the facts of geology, the space is filled with things geopoetical. And I think it's that geopoetry that we kind of forget, the romanticism of what we go into. We kind of forget that is a, the way of an Arizona. It's a, a there's a sandstone um, that is now sculpted by one of the most simple rock type uh, landscape geomorphic creature there is, and yet it's stunningly beautiful. And we shouldn't forget that in saying, well, it's just a sandstone. And then the other thing is the job to communicate is to entertain. <coughs> it's full stop. That's what your job is. Um, it's again, it's Ted's quote from an earlier paper, basically. He said, and that quote basically says that look, when you start to communicate with news or with talk about you are entering, you're stepping out of academia, you're entering the entertainment industry. And if you don't get that, then you're mistaken about what that, your role as a communicator is. Or you're not likely to be as effective about that. And some people, again, feel very uncomfortable. Well, I'm an academic, I'm a scientist, why am I doing an entertainment industry? But the point is that you're out there, because people don't have to listen to you. They don't have to take the time to read your paper, or to come up and talk to you, uh, read your, uh, you know, an hour's talk or something like that. They're taking time out of their life to do it, so you need to make it entertaining and engaging for them to do that. And so I'm just going to come back to the last, uh, the last kind of section of you, which is not where we're talking about story, set up story. But how is that going to help with something like fracking? But these really dodgy, messy issues that are very contested. Um, and I'm going to talk about going into something I call outrage uh, now. The first quote comes from, I've got a name on this, the head of BP just before he left. And this is talking about the, the Corn Gas uh, Project that was had a massive overrun. I'm sure you all know about it far better than I do. But um, I like this quote from him. It says, we underestimated the level of community concern and unrest. Inadequate engagement led to decisions that in hindsight were to a legalistic approach rather than really understanding what the concerns were and then spending some of the extra time working on it. What we ended up doing to rebuild relations and trust was what we should have done in the first place. That was having local community people engaged as liaisons, working at the very start of the project to understand what the concerns were rather than being driven by project schedule, which is essentially what happened. We didn't have what we might call social license. <coughs> And he goes on to talk about the fact that um, what they should have done is they spent lots of money on seismic, so imaging down into the subsurface, and they should have spent a lot more on social seismic. 
actually imaging the communities that they were actually going to be potentially affected. So that's what I want to carry on through. And I want to do it through actually, well, what do people think about science? I'm going to take my one from an Australian study from 2004, but actually a lot of these are the same. They break the public down into different types. They talk about who they, they are. And um, so you are fanboys and girls, according to their scheme. There's about a quarter, 23%, are people who are very comfortable with science, very close to science. Will watch science documentaries, bless you. Uh, you'll read <laughs> science articles, you might pick up Scientific American or something. You're comfortable having a conversation about science. You then have Mr. and Mrs. Average, who are not quite as comfortable about science, they're not against it at all. Um, but uh, they probably they might watch their science documentary if that nice Mr. Attenborough was in it, but they probably wouldn't pick up a scientific American or a new scientist, etc. Then there's the 8%, they the wish I could understand it. These are the most interested in science. They tend to be older generation people who realise they've kind of disconnected from science. They, they're the ones that most likely to go to science festivals, science fairs. But they're very conscious that when they encounter scientific information, they don't understand it. They don't understand the language, they can't get it, and they feel very frustrated by it. And then we've got another set of groups. The set of groups, again, roughly about a quarter, and it says, look, there's too many other issues. You know, I've got the migrant crisis, the economy, I don't have time to be bothered with science. Then there's the, actually, I hate science. I hate it at school. I put me off, I'm a terrible teacher, and I've never done it since. And when science comes up, I just step back. I can't believe you've seen the documentaries, I've never seen them. Really so. And then there's the last lot, and this is an interesting lot, the very small, 2%, the I know all I need to know. These are people who are absolute, um, kind of vigorously read up about science, but come at it from a pseudo science or an unorthodox angle. It could be religious, it could be coming out from a particular religious bent. Or it could be that they're coming out from a particular you know, pseudo you know, science area or a very alternative way. Um, but they think they've read lots of science. And actually, they won't listen to what scientists are saying because they know it all and they don't need to read the science because they know what it is. So these are the ones that tend to be very noisy, uh, testing about science. Uh, and I know often they need it. But the point is that about, I don't know, 40% or so when you add that up, are they disengaged? So here's a question for you. Who should I aim my documentaries at? Which of these groupings should I aim my documentary at? So I'm making a fake BBC too soon. So it's only said all of them, I think, is that right? Who would you say is the most important audience for me? First two? First two? Second two? Second two? Across the board. First one? And you're shaking your head, why not the first one? Well, they're already convinced, so you're you know, preaching to a, 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 a convicted or an enthusiastic audience. Yeah, this is a bit, it's quite embarrassing, because my programs are not for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you watch them, but the reason I don't have to make them for you is because you will watch them, because you're interested in them. Apologies. <laughs> so, there's an eye on this audience, absolutely. But broadly, it's in this territory. The one, the prize, is to get people over here to shift across the world. And in fact, if there's one thing that that, the, you know, the attempt is, and, but that requires you to play tricks, you to make the material a lot thinner, more superficial, for example, to play lots of loud music, that's one of the usual things that people hear. Um, if it's uh, one with uh, commercials in it, to have lots of signposting, to remind people what they've heard, etc. Which is why I'll be doing stupid things like jumping in pools or something like that. So people say, wait a second, seems a nice little lad there. So you just don't like watch this for about five minutes. All of this is about trying to do this left hand shift to take people across. Um, but the, the point is, they are the difficult ones. They are, you are easy. Sorry. Um, <laughs> these ones are okay, but if we can get more of this shifted across, it's just a skew to the left. And the other thing that um, that Australian study, that was about uh, public attitudes to science. We also looked at values, belief systems. What is it people believe? Now, these are all some of the questions and the topics they had. So these are about belief about science, values, the benefits of science, the greater and harmful effects, 
We depend too much on science, not enough on faith, for example. So a number of questions you might ask. And these ones are just generic values, not really science, so should children be protected to, to pull out people who are really um, you know, very risk averse. Uh, people shouldn't tamper with nature in terms of their general view. And now the pictures you see are all taken when I went down to just set the Guildford to a potential site where there's fracking going on. So what I like to do is I like to do this to people and I like you to tell me, I'll ask you whether you think they're for or against fracking. So let's say these this pair here, who thinks they're for fracking? Just kind of do that on your hand though. Who thinks they're against? Uh, they're for. Uh, what about uh, what about this pair here? He's just been washing the car, she's just gonna see why we do it. Who thinks they're for fracking? Who thinks they're against fracking? They're for <laughs> <laughs> this chap here lives in a very uh, affluent house, um, 500 meters away from the, the drilling fracking site. Who thinks they're for fracking? He's for fracking. Who thinks against fracking? You're absolutely right. I thought I'd give you an easy one. <laughs> this girl here, young toddler, who thinks she's for fracking? Who thinks she's against? She's for. That's <laughs> uh, so this chap here, elderly gent in the community. Who thinks he's for fracking? Against? He's for fracking. <laughs> he says this was a working landscape. They chop the downs, the mines here, iron mines, etc. You know, this is a place we just don't want to be a commuter about for London. This is a place we want real jobs. <coughs> this lady, oh, this man here, selling the common. That's his house with a UKIP poster in it, just at the window there. <laughs> Who thinks it's for fracking? <coughs> Who thinks it's against fracking? He's against fracking. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't like it at all. This lady here runs the B&B that we stayed in and runs the pub. Who thinks she's for fracking? Who thinks she's against fracking? She's against fracking. Oh. She's against fracking because they're obviously business <coughs> well, but the pub is a fulcrum of the village and she's seen her village being torn apart by it. And so she's extremely concerned. The interesting one is this one here, I think, which everyone always gets wrong, and I got wrong at the time as well. She said to me, um, she said, yeah, no, I thought I think it would, I think it would be quite good. I think it would be a good job. Um, we just want these, these people to do. And then she said, of course, I don't mind about it. <laughs> so I reckon it would only take her 10 minutes in the pub top of this guy to be against So that's it, you're right. Now the reason why you find that so difficult is because actually what determines whether those people are is their value judgments and their belief system. It's not the level of education they're selling and you have it's very hard, you're second guessing uh, some of that. So what's interesting is Australian studies put up the numbers of um, oh, what it does is it segments the, that public into different four categories on the basis of values. And this is really important. So, they're kind of the same as before, but they're a little bit different. So this is the science fan, Euros of science fans. Then there's a cautiously keen, that say, yeah, science is all right, but you know, like, yeah, worrying, a little bit more in here and there. Then there is people that say, they're going, hey, everything's good as it is, just don't change anything, we're quite happy with things are. And then there's people who really don't like science or are very distrustful of it. Now, the next set of graphs are going to be like this, and they're going to be looking at those basic values. And the key thing I want you to look at isn't the details, I want you to look at where we are. Where is the green dot? Because I think there's something interesting here. So what is it? Lots of people play with data. What is the interesting thing about the green area? The most disengaged. We're the most disengaged. We're the outlier. So the perverseness, paradox, is that we're the ones with the technical, we feel the technical knowledge. And yet, in terms of our belief systems and value systems, we are the one that's least like the other social groups. So that's really important because one of the things that people uh, do when they're communicating is to try to take information from people whose values and beliefs they think are very simple. So all right, we come up with the technical knowledge, but it's quite clear when we're talking to you that our belief systems don't agree with it. And therefore, that's us in a disregard. So in all of these ones, the other groups have more overlap than we do. So the conclusions. When information is complex, 
People make decisions based on their values and beliefs. That was that mother from the mother and toddlers group saying, all this complexity, I'm going with my instinct, it doesn't feel right. Second thing is people look for confirmation, for affirmation of those beliefs, no matter how loony they are. They will search out something that shows them that they are right and reject anything that seems to run counter to that. Thirdly is people trust those who are like themselves. In the Australian study, for the disengaged, when they asked people, who do you trust for your scientific information? They said, friends, families and media commentators. Not because they were deemed to have any greater technical knowledge, but because they were people they trusted about other things as well. Attitudes that are not formed by logical facts are not influenced by logical facts alone. And that places us in a really interesting point. Because actually, what is it we communicate and when? We communicate and we try to focus on logical, factual arguments about the science we try and convey that. But if that's not the reason that people have made the position, then actually all of that just passes by. So the final one for them is the, the public, the serious studies. Public concerns about contentious science and technology are almost never about the science. Scientific information, therefore, does little to influence their concerns. So you may think, oh my god, if that's true, then what the hell do we do? Because that's what we've got. We've been trained in all of that technical scientific information. And if we can't use that to get arguments across, then what are we supposed to do? And it's in this where we get back to um, this business, because this is a work from American uh, environmental journalist that's looking at hazards. <coughs> uh, he said that, that the public often misrepresent the hazard. What that means is that if you if you have an expert against the public about something, by and large, the expert will place a kind of risk here and the public will have a risk much significantly higher in those cases. The experts often misperceive the outrage. The outrage is the natural anger that's in a particular um, community. It's the main problem is that the public doesn't really care about the hazard. We'll come back to this. The experts don't really care about the anger. So they're kind of on two different sides of the problem. In other words, the, the, the expert is fixated by the, the facts, the technical language, but the public aren't interested in that, and so they're kind of sort of missing each other. So this is from uh, 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 Balcom, after the kind of fracking one in the UK. And these are people who are very, very angry about fracking. So one of the interesting things is that maybe they're interested in the hazard, and they, they think their view of the hazard is misconceived. They put it too high in relation to the experts. Um, so if that is the case, if people are outraged because they've overestimated the hazard, then it's easy for us. Our solution is to explain the hazard better. And they'll go, oh, thank you very much, now you've explained that hazard better. I'm now okay with this process. But actually, Sandman uh, says that's a pretty rare occurrence in environmental crisis. Much more likely is that people are overestimating the hazard because they're angry. In other words, people are upset about something, they're angry, they read about it, and the more they read, the more angry they get because they're picking up, they're going to information that reinforces it, and they're driving up their anger levels. So that when the expert then comes in and says, well, your anger levels are too high because that has has been overinflated, it comes down. There is still residual anger at the core that the scientist says, well, that's got nothing to do with the technical stuff, that's nothing to do with you. So what does do it? I'm not going through all of these, but social science has been dealing with this for a while. Is it something, this is what sets the levels of outrage across a, a community. Is something been forced on them or on them? Is something industrial or is it natural? You know, triggering humans, triggering earthquakes is seen as an industrial and as an exotic thing. Anything exotic is what? Very high. Is it memorable or is it something that you can actually just measure? Is it dreaded? That's a kind of nuclear thing here. Is it something that's catastrophic? Is it not normal? Does it have a high degree of uncertainty? That makes people very nervous as well. And, but the ones on the right are probably the more important. Is it controlled by another? How much self-control do you or your community have in some of these decisions? So if you feel you have a lot of control, that's good. If it's controlled by me or by your community, that's good. But if it's controlled by someone else at the time, that's very bad. Is it uh, morally relevant? Uh, sorry, more about hardly relevant. Fairness. Is it fair? Are the benefits 
of whatever it is going to those people who are pulling the risk or are they disconnected spatially we're going somewhere else in the company or the, the group that you're in are they trustworthy and as i would indicate whether they're trustworthy one of the things is how responsive are they to your concerns so when you say um, i don't like the idea of you doing geothermal because um, you're going to put a borehole down and the magma's going to come out and the geologist laughs at you and says that's ridiculous now that's seen as someone who's not very very responsive to your concerns it's not going to be a very extreme time. But the point is that any of those issues that we deal with, set levels, and even in a community, these levels will change with every individual. So the, the, the issue that we've got, I think, is, um, just to kind of sum up, is that I think what we need to do as scientists is to start listening to people about what their concerns are. And the reason that we need to do that is not because they've got an indigenous, homegrown knowledge that's better than ours. It's that when we know what their concerns are, we can then try to, to explain our technical knowledge in these narratives that people can actually engage with. So we have to know what their concerns are, but we also to know what they're interested in. And by that, we can make them connect them to our world. But at the moment, what's happening is that we've got a certain technical knowledge about the soft surface, and we're kind of packaging that and just pushing out people and saying, we're the experts, and this is the information you need to know. And at the moment, of course, people confronted with that complexity are just going on their instinct, and that instinct is in a very different place by and large to really the scientists. So I think that, you know, in terms of the due communication, we need to learn to speak better, to communicate better. But perhaps it's very important to be able to listen better to those people who are less than us. Thank you very much.